Okay, let's move on with the silicates. In the last class, we started to discuss how we can uh, classify um, silicates. And there are a couple of more parameters uh, that we need to discuss. So the first one um, is the periodicity. So the periodicity counts the number of tetrahedral rings or layers that represent a repeating unit. So you have illustrated that here for the example of um, um, chains. So you see that you have three, three different uh, chains and um, the periodicity in these chains varies from one to two to three. So here in the first chain, the periodicity is one. That is because one repeating unit contains only one tetrahedron. In other words, when we translate one tetrahedron along the chain, then the next tetrahedron uh, uh, superimposes the first tetrahedron. So here, um, the periodicity of is two. That means that we actually have to translate by two um, tetrahedra in order to achieve uh, superposition. Okay, so if we place ourselves, for instance, on this first tetrahedron here, we have to move along one and two, uh, along two tetrahedra until uh, we uh, have achieved uh, superposition. So here in the last example, the periodicity is three. That means that we have to go along three tetrahedra until we meet a tetrahedron, which is um, equivalent to the first one. So for instance, again, if we put ourselves on this tetrahedron here, we have to move this tetrahedron here along one, two, three tetrahedra. Um, then we will meet a tetrahedron which is equivalent to the original one. So this is what is meant by periodicity. So um, finally, there's also uh, the multiplicity. So the multiplicity means the number of building units. And now that can be polyhedra, chains, rings, or layers, which are connected to form larger arrays of the same dimensionality. So the dimensionality has to be the same. This is the important point to understand. So for instance, um, here we have uh, uh, <clears throat> a chain, which is a so-called uh, single chain because the multiplicity is one, okay? So there is no, uh, well, second chain fused to the first chain that would increase the multiplicity beyond uh, one. So whereas here in the, in the second example, we have the multiplicity two, we then say that is a double chain, okay? Because um, that chain, okay, is well multiplied by the factor two producing here another chain whereby the second chain is fused together with the first chain to form a band, okay? So the band still has the same dimensionality as a simple chain. So that means we still have the same <clears throat> dimensionality, okay? So here <clears throat> you have an example of a, of a triple chain where the multiplicity is three. So in this case, we have actually three single chains uh, fused together to make a band, um, which is now a triple chain. Okay, so this is meant by um, multiplicity. So we have now reviewed um, all the parameters. Now let us look at um, how nature realizes um, these uh, structural principles and uh, which ones are more common than other ones and how we can rationalize that. So let us start 
with silicates uh, that are zero dimensional and the most simple zero dimensional class of silicates are the nesosilicates. So in the nesosilicates, we have isolated SiO4 for minus um, ions. So what is an example for that? So an example for that is the mineral olivine. Um, so this is an iron magnesium orthosilicate. Okay whereby um, the um, stoichiometric ratio between iron and manganese and, and olivine and can be continuously varied, okay? So if there's only magnesium present, okay, we, we call this kind of olivine the magnesium end member, then we talk about the phosphoride. And uh, if you have only iron, in the olivine, then we call this the iron end member, and the mineral, mineral is called the phyolite. Okay. However, you can actually mix um, iron and magnesium in the structure continuously. Okay. So you can describe uh, the olivine structure also by uh, the principles of closed packed structures. So in the olivine, we have a uh, Hexagonal closed packed uh, uh, lattice of oxides, and then one eighth of the tetrahedral holes occupied by silicon, and 50% uh, of the octahedral holes are occupied by magnesium. Uh, in the case we have the, the phosphoride, of course, the octahedral holes could also be occupied by um, um, iron. All right. So now in silicate chemistry, even though we can use the concept of closed packed structures in order to describe uh, uh, silicates, at least some of them, um, this kind of description is not uh, uh, necessarily the most useful one. The most useful one to describe a structure is always the one that uh, 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 provides the most facile understanding of the of the of the crystal of the crystal structure. Um, so um, the closed packed structures are the concept of the closed packed structure is most useful for um, compounds in which you have non-directional bonding, a high degree of ionicity. Um, in the case of silicates, we already have a significant significant degree of covalency and therefore directional bonding. Therefore, um, the concept of closed packed structure is relatively rarely used to describe silicates. So you usually describe um, how uh, silicates with respect to how the polyhedra that occur in the silicate structure are interconnected. Um, so um, this is illustrated, illustrated here for another example of a mesosilicate. Um, it's called the garnet. So the garnet um, has the following composition. We have A3, 2 plus, B2, 3 plus, um, SiO4, 3 as the composition, whereby A is a divalent cation such as calcium, magnesium, iron two plus or manganese two plus. And B is a trivalent cation, um, for instance, aluminum, iron three plus or uh, chromium three plus. So you see here um, the, the crystal structure and you see from this crystal structure here that you have isolated SiO4 tetrahedra. However, uh, nonetheless, it makes sense to uh, understand this crystal structure as a three-dimensional structure because the um, SiO4 tetrahedra are interconnected via other uh, polyhedra in particular. Um, you have a BO6 octahedra, you see those here in green. So that would be either uh, aluminum, 
uh, 06, Fe06 or chromium 06. Okay. And now these uh, green octahedra interconnect the red tetrahedra in order to produce a, a, a three dimensional network. Okay. So um, this is how you can understand um, the structure. So last but not least, we also need to consider the A ions and the A ions are basically in the voids produced by that framework of octa interconnected framework of octahedra and tetrahedra that by the way, are corners as you can see here, whereby um, the A ions have a coordination number eight. Um, they are surrounded by oxygen ions that belong um, to the um, SI4 and AO6 um, octahedra in a distorted uh, cubic way. Okay, however, all polyhedra are overall corner sharing. So these are two examples for mesosilicates. Um, so here is actually even a third example, which is the zircon. So this is zirconium um, silicate. So here all the four uh, negative charges of the SiO4 for minus anions are uh, compensated by a single cation. In this case, it's zirconium four plus. Um, so you see again here, um, the crystal structure, you see here the isolated SiO4 for minus anions. So you see here in green, how the zirconium ions are actually coordinated. And in this case, we have uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, zirconium, which, zirconium ions, which are uh, coordinated by seven oxygen ions whereby you have again corner sharing polyhedra. So this green polyhedron is sharing corners with the red um, polyhedra. Again, that gives overall a, a three-dimensional three -dimensional framework. All right, um, so zircon um, is used as a pigment. Um, <coughs> you can use it as a white pigment because it has a high refraction index, but it can also give it various colors when you dope it with transition metals. For instance, when you dope it with vanadium four plus ions, then it becomes blue. Uh, when you dope it with praseodymium three plus becomes yellow. And when you dope it with iron uh, three plus, then it becomes um, pink. So um, now let's go from um, mesosilicates to sorosilicates. So we now talk about silicates in which a few um, SiO4 units are interconnected. So in the most simple case, it's two. And three, we actually have really more than two or three. So most sorosilicates are disilicates. So one example for a, a disilicate is the thortretite so you see here in this crystal structure, the SI, two SiO4 tetrahedra, which are corner sharing. And now these SiO4 tetrahedra are further interconnected with um, layers of, uh, of edge sharing scandium O6 octahedra, yeah, whereby these um, Layers are made of six um, octahedra, okay, that form six membered rings. And then these six membered rings are fused together to form layers. So here you have another example, which is called thalonite. So the thalonite is a, a trisilicate. You see here in the unit cell, we have three interconnected SiO4 um, tetrahedra um, using here as for the 
<clears throat> let me um, let me um, count there. Uh, cations. In addition, we also have some hydroxide anions in the structure. So um, now, finally, we also have ring silicates as zero-dimensional silicates. Um, I believe in the last class there was already a question: Are uh, the ring sizes all equally common? I said already they are not. So generally, three and six membered rings are most common. Um, four, eight, nine, and twelve membered rings are also relatively common, but not as common. Uh, and anything else, including rings that have branches, are quite rare. So many gemstones are actually ring um, silicates. For instance, uh, uh, smaragds and aquamarines. So smaragds and aquamarines are derived from the beryl structure, uh, which you see here. So you see in this uh, beryl structure, we have uh, six-membered uh, rings of SiO4 uh, tetrahedra that form that form channels. Okay, so these rings are uh, making channel structure, and then uh, these rings are interconnected by these green octahedra here, whereby in the center of uh, these octahedra there is uh, aluminum and beryllium um, respectively. So now you can again dope uh, that structure with other metals. So when you dope it with chromium vanadium, then you get um, smaragds. When you dope with iron, replacing some of the aluminums with iron, then uh, you get um, aquamarine. So the beryl is also the mineral, which is the primary industrial source for um, beryl metal. Okay, so here you have an example of a ring silicate with uh, three rings. Um, it's called the benitrite. So this is a barium titanium ring silicate. Okay, so you see here we have basically stacks of um, three rings. And then again, these three rings are interconnected by octahedra, whereby in the center of the octahedra we have now titanium. And inside of the channels, as you see here, then you have your um, um, biome atoms. Also other gemstones like uh, dioptas or tumaline, they are ring silicates, uh, in particular six ring um, silicates. Okay, so now um, let's go from zero dimensional silicates to one dimensional silicates. So which structures does nature prefer in this case? Okay. So now first let's go to uh, chain silicates, um, which are also called inosilicates. So in the most uh, simple case, we have one so-called one single chains. So that means that the periodicity is one and the multiplicity is also one. Um, so um, if you have choose the periodicity to be one, then you arrive at this structure here. Okay, so shifting um, a tetrahedron, well, by only one tetrahedron produces an identical tetrahedron. Um, so this is a pretty simple structure. However, uh, nature doesn't realize it. And the answer for that is that the uh, terminal oxygens who carry the negative charges come very close when 
uh, you arrange the tetrahedra like that. And of course, the negative charge of the oxygen atom repel each other. So essentially, due to the high ionicity, relatively high ionicity in these silicates, um, there's too much electrostatic repulsion between the tetrahedra so that this structure is never uh, realized. However, it is realized in some non silicious compounds that are also made of tetrahedra, which are less uh, ionic. So for instance, in, in copper, uh, in the copper germinates CuGeO3 or on the barium zinc sulfide Ba2 zinc S3. So in the former case, you have GeO4 tetrahedra that make one single chains. And in the latter case, you have zinc S4 tetrahedra that make one single chain. So much more common in silicate chemistry are two single chains. So that means now that the uh, periodicity is um, one. Uh, sorry, that the periodicity is two. Okay, and uh, this is this is shown here. So this is much more uh, favorable because um, the well negative charges at the oxygens, at the terminal oxygens don't come so close, okay? So you have negative charges here and here in the first tetrahedron, and here and here in the second tetrahedron, and the, well, the two tetrahedra corner share, but otherwise the tetrahedra orient so that the uh, terminal oxygens are as far away as possible from each other, okay? So this makes these two single chains uh, very common. So there's one mineral in particular, which is uh, very common, uh, which is called the pyroxenes that has the general composition ABSI2O6, okay? Whereby A is typically calcium and sodium, and B is magnesium, iron, and um, aluminum. Okay, so here is one uh, concrete example of a pyroxene. It's called the orthopyroxene, whereby ortho just uh, means that the crystal system in which that structure crystallizes is orthorhombic. Okay, so the composition is uh, Fe, magnesium, SiO3 whereby again, you can uh, continuously vary the composition or the stoichiometric ratio between iron and magnesium from uh, iron only to mixture of iron and magnesium to magnesium only. So magnesium end member is called the enstatite, the iron end member is called the ferrocillite in mineralogy. So you see here, um, how you can understand the crystal structure. So we have here these um, two single chains. And in this view, actually we look along the chain and because the periodicity is two, we only see two tetrahedra, okay? So you have to imagine here that the third tetrahedron would be behind the first one in the chain and the fourth tetrahedron would be behind the second one and so forth. Okay, so now um, these uh, two single chains are fused together with layers of um, AO6 and BO6 octahedra, okay? Whereby A and B can be either uh, magnesium or iron uh, respectively. And then um, these bands here at the corners con uh, connect to further um, chains of uh, SiO4 tetrahedra, whereby um, the tetrahedra here and here point in the opposite direction as these two tetrahedra, okay? And then um, this chain here and that chain here which has tetrahedra pointing downward connects to further uh, bands of 
AU6 and PU6 um, octahedra. Okay, you see this here in a, in a somewhat uh, different view. Okay, so now you look actually perpendicular to the chains, and you see um, these chains here all have their tetrahedra point downward, and uh, well. Um, one of the oxygen atoms, um, this would be this one here of each tetrahedron is connected to that band of um, edge here in octahedra. Okay. And basically the next chain of silicates would be localized here. And you would see, you can see here that now these um, tetrahedra point in the opposite direction. Okay, so they point upwards, while these these ones here they point um, downward. So this gives this overall uh, crystal structure here, in which basically you have uh, well bands of so bands of uh, octahedra, okay, which are interconnected by chains of um, SiO4 tetrahedra. Okay, um, so in the previous example, the periodicity was two. However, we can also have ionosilicates with uh, significantly larger periodicities. However, uh, these are increasingly rare, but they are known. So here uh, you see a mineral, it's called the rhodonite. So this is calcium, magnesium 4, SiO3, uh, 5, um, in which you have um, an ionosilicate with a periodicity of five. So you see here the unit cell, and you see here these chains going through the unit cell. Okay, now you can count the number of tetrahedra until you arrive at a tetrahedron which is identical to the first one. Okay, so we can, for instance, put ourselves on this one, and this is the first one. Then we enter the unit cell, we have here the second one, here's the third one is the fourth one, and that would be the fifth one. And then the next one, this one here, would be identical to the first one that we have encountered here. All right, so here you see uh, another ionosilicate, which has an even longer, uh, higher periodicity. It's called the pyrox ferroid. So this is a manganese, iron, calcium, magnesium, um, silicate. And uh, we can determine the periodicity of uh, that one. Does anybody want to count the number of tetrahedra? How many do we have here? What is the periodicity? Is it uh, six? Six? Uh, well, more than that. Chat looks like five. Yeah, I think. Oh it's, yeah. It's it's more. So let's count it. Let's count it together. Another suggestion. And seven on the bottom. Yeah. So. Let us um, do this together. We can, for instance, uh, take this one. Okay, so this one here is at the border of the unit cell. Yeah, and now this one is the first one, and this is the second one. This is the third one. This is the fourth one. This is the fifth one. This is the sixth one. 
And that's the seventh one. Okay. And the eighth one here is identical to the first one. So indeed, the periodicity is seven. Okay. So we can have even higher periodicities. So here, for instance, the periodicity is nine. Um, so this is an iron uh, inosilicate. And this lead silicate, um, alumocyte, which is a rare mineral, it's, it's, it's 12. And uh, here, uh, in this compound, it's even uh, 24. Okay. You can have, can have indeed very, very long um, chains of um, SIO4 tetrahedra. Um, but in general, the longer you make the chain, the more rare, the more rarely you will find um, these chains to be realized. Uh, Tom, you raised your hand. Is that still current? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, I was just curious because uh, if the P12 is, uh, you know, a rare mineral, but the 24 chain is synthetic, uh, what's the advantage of going through the lanes to make something like that? Like, is there intrinsic properties that are favorable? Like, that seems like it would be pretty uh, involved syn synthesis. Well, um, solid solid state chemistry, in contrast to materials chemistry and materials science, is much more uh, structure inspired. Okay, so we actually ex systematically explore the structural space which is available within a class of uh, compounds, okay? So basically uh, uh, seeing what are the, the, the limits in, in, in the periodicities can, you can reach is basically a, a fundamental question which is considered to be interesting in itself, okay? Not necessarily in, in, in solid state uh, chemistry, you go after a specific property uh, that you might expect and then tailor your synthesis accordingly. Okay, so it's more about gener generating knowledge, okay, answering the question uh, what compounds does nature make and why? Okay, and the final goal is really to synthesize all uh, the compounds that. Uh, nature that nature makes because, because then I have achieved a comprehensive knowledge over uh, uh, a class of compounds. Okay, I know what compositions to make, I know what structures to make. Okay, so the, uh, uh, the property is actually uh, more a, a, a side aspect then. Okay, so a property would be more discovered rather than rationally, rationally designed through a solid state synthesis. Got it. Okay, thank you. All right. So now let's go from um, single chains to double chains. And then uh, we arrive at the most simple form of what is called a band silicate. In the double chain, the multiplicity is two. So the most simple case, the periodicity would be one. Okay. And we would arrive at this structure here. Okay. So, um, this structure is very rare um, in nature because it's A, pretty strained, and B, it's electrostatically unfavored. 
Okay, so these four membered wings are fairly strained in the way the tetrahedra are oriented relative to each other. And they are again unfavorable electrostatic interaction in the sense that the terminal oxygens that carry the negative charges repel each other. Okay. There, is, there are, however, uh, a few examples in nature. For instance, uh, this compound here, which is a sodium magnesium um, silicate that makes that kind of structure, but generally that kind of structure is uh, very rare. All right. So much more favorable are, again, higher uh, uh, periodicities. So um, you see here, um, binary silicates with double chains, whereby now the periodicity is two. Um, you can think of two basic versions. Um, this version here, okay, where only every second tetrahedron connects. Yeah. So you see that um, this tetrahedron of the first chain connects with another tetrahedron of the second chain. But this tetrahedron here yeah, does not connect to the second chain in any way. Only this tetrahedron here co again connects to the second chain. All right. Um, so this kind of structure is uh, quite common because a um, you can form rings that have little strain, and B, um, you can bring the negative charges uh, uh, fairly far apart from each other. Okay, in particular, you have now actually these two negative charges here at this tetrahedron spatially uh, separated um, from, from these two, and well, the negative charges of a second tetrahedron is also relatively far apart from the negative charge here at uh, the, the tetrahedra that basically connect to the second chain. So that kind of uh, structure is uh, very common. There's another basic possibility, how you can realize a two double chain, which is however not known in nature just because the first possibility is so much more favorable. So in this in this case, every tetrahedron uh, connects and that again forms these uh, strain strings. So in this case here, um, the reddish color means that a tetrahedron points up while a white one would point down. So you still have a periodicity of two, but now every tetrahedron of each single chain connects with another chain. So for silicates, uh, this is not known in nature, um, but um, a somewhat related silicon uh, germinate is known in which some of the or even most of the silicons are substituted by uh, germanium. Um, and this compound is the lithium-4 silicon germanium-3 um, O10. But this is pretty much the only example of um, such kind of structure. Okay, um, one can again further increase the periodicity. So overall, we can have up to several uh, seven double chains in band silicates, and they all can occur in different uh, varieties. We would go beyond the scope of the of this course here to discuss them. Or so we'll stick here to the uh, discussion of a few two double chains in more detail. All right. Uh, so here they are. Um, 
So uh, silicates with two double chains in which every second tetrahedron um, connects are called the amphibolts. Um, which have the general formula described here. So you ha can have three different cations, A, P, and C. Um, in addition to that, you can also have hydroxide and fluoride ions in the structure, whereby A can be uh, sodium and calcium, B can be magnesium, iron, two plus, and C can be magnesium, two plus, aluminum, three plus, and iron, three, or two plus. Okay, um, now you see here um, the actual structure of such an amphibole. Um, so you see here actually the double chains, two double chains of SiO4 tetrahedra, and you see that these um, chains are um, now fuse two layers of octahedra, okay? Whereby these layers of octahedra uh, contain the element C, so either magnesium, aluminum, or um, iron. And um, the remaining um, A and B ions are then, well, um, physically charged compensating the uh, charge of these these bands of interconnected um, tetrahedral and octahedral bands. Okay, so basically A and B they counterbalance that double band. All right, um, so here is a more complicated uh, kind of amphibole which is uh, called the tremolite. So the previous example, I didn't mention this, was actually a so-called one-to-one amphibole and that means that one tetrahedral band is connected with one octahedral band in a one-to-one -one ratio. So the, the tremolite, this example here, represents a so-called two-to-one amphibole and that means that we have two bands of tetrahedra, which are shown here and here, which are actually sandwiching an octahedral band. Okay, so in the octahedral band we have edge sharing octahedra, okay, and then um, some of the oxygens within these octahedra are being shared with the tetrahedral bands. Okay, so one tetrahedral band points downward, this one, and the other tetrahedral band points upward. Okay, so that again gives, well, um, one dimensional structures um, that are then packed in a crystal. And you see actually here how these, these bands are being packed. You see the unit cell, okay, you see that one band, type of band sits here on the corners of the unit cell. Okay, and basically the a fifth one actually moves to the center of the unit cell. Okay, and then there are other, again, other counter cations that compensate the charge, the charges at that, that band. All right. Um, so that uh, tremolite actually represents one form of asbestos, uh, just as a, as a side comment. And that's actually one of the uh, most dangerous forms of asbestos because now basically the, 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 the structure also determines the, the crystal shape. Okay, so now we have these band structures and because of these band structures the the crystals form actually very fine long needles okay and these needles can disperse uh, in air and actually form stable dispersions in air 
um, which um, um, is uh, uh, very hard at worst, so it can cause the known um, diseases associated with asbestos, such as uh, lung uh, cancer. Therefore, uh, such compounds are currently uh, are not used anymore. Um, however, there are other forms of asbestos which are still used, which are far less toxic, and I will talk about that also in a, in a moment, probably in the next class. All right, um, then um, we can have even more complicated um, inosilicates, um, for instance, branched silicates, but that is um, quite rare because here we have different types of tetrahedra to consider. So these tetrahedra have actually two terminal oxygens, while these tetrahedra here have only uh, one terminal oxygen. So there have to be special reasons in place why nature does uh, something like that and only makes it under relatively rare circumstances. So we see that uh, the example cited here, which is called the astrophyllite, has a quite complicated composition. Please don't memorize that. So it's a potassium two, sodium two, um, iron, manganese five, magnesium two, titanium two, Si4O12. And uh, even some oxide, hydroxide, and fluoride ions in that structure. So something like that is not uh, common in nature, just also because you need so many elements to be present at the same time in order to make uh, such a compound. Okay. Um, then uh, we can also have loop branched inosilicates. Um, so that means that you basically make chains from rings. That is uh, also possible, even though not very common. So here are just uh, two examples. So this example here is the called the Vlasovite. So this is a sodium zirconium silicate. You actually have <clears throat> bands of uh, four-membered rings. So you consider this a loop branched inosilicate. Um, by defining basically this single chain here going through the structure and then these tetrahedra here would basically uh, belong to a side branch which is closing a loop. Okay, so here is another example. This is called the diorite. So this is an iron uh, silicate. So here you have six membered rings. So again, you would define the main chain, a main chain going through the crystal and then two tetrahedra would be considered to be the side branch which closes it, which closes a loop. So again, we could think about the periodicity of these um, inosilicates. Um, so we would have to count the number of tetrahedra uh, until we have we arrive at a tetrahedron which is identical to the first one. We could, for instance, start with this, this one here, then we would have to go one, two, three, four, five. And the sixth one would be identical to the first one. So the periodicity would be five here, for instance. So here, if we started with this tetrahedron here, okay, we would have to go one, two, three. So sorry, one, two, three, four. And then this one here would be identical to the first one. So in this case, the periodicity would be four. All right, then uh, let us stop at this point.